For some, it was the obvious next step in the rocket-propelled growth and continued evolution of a brand they had been following for years finally realized. For others, it was a new and exciting gateway and entry point into a unique world of superheroes feared and hated for their abilities coming together to protect the world from forces of evil. It wasn't any old cartoon, it was an animated series with a continuous narrative building the dramatic tension over the course of the season in a deliberate chronology just like the comics they were inspired by. And it was one of THE symbols of 90s pop culture. Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the History of the X-Men Animated Series. Marvel's animation history goes back to the 60s. In their first decade of existence, Marvel superheroes were already being featured in cartoons. The barely animated Marvel superheroes cartoon debuted in 1966. A single season, each episode was a compilation of shorts featuring Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, and the Submariner. Other characters would make special guest appearances, including villains like Doctor Doom, Magneto, and the original roster of the X-Men. From 1967 to 1980, Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, and Spider-Woman would take their turns carrying the banner of Marvel in cartoons. In 1981, Spider-Man got a modern makeover with two new shows, Spider-Man and Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. Spidey's friends were a fire and ice duo, one of the original X-Men, Iceman, and since the Human Torch was tied up in a solo licensing deal with Universal Studios at the time for a television show that never materialized, a new character called Firestar. Spider-Man and Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends ran from 1981 to 1983 and then were rebroadcast from 1984 to 1986. And hey, if you have it, you have it. You might as well use it. You know, they like to just have it. Maybe separate, so we have it. So we have it. That way we have it. That way you have it. So both shows were then re-rebroadcast in 1988 as part of the Marvel Action Universe with first-timers Robocop and Dino Riders. Always trying to expand out beyond Spider-Man in the animated offerings, Marvel commissioned a single episode pilot of an X-Men cartoon using what would have been the budget for the 13th episode of the Robocop series. Twelve episodes were probably enough to sell the toys that they wanted to sell, right? The single episode titled Pride of the X-Men aired on September 16, 1989 and would be rebroadcast every so often through 1989 during the second season of the Marvel Action Universe, but despite its growing popularity as a comic property, it was never Ever picked up for a full season. It didn't connect with studio executives, but I can assure you that it was so good that some kids queued up the VHS every week hoping this would be one of the weeks that they randomly rebroadcast that single amazing episode of X-Men. Kids today just don't know how good you have it with media on demand. Didn't matter because that same year Marvel Entertainment Group was purchased by the Andrews Group and they ceased production on all animated series except for Muppet Babies for obvious reasons. I mean, it had Indiana Jones and Star Wars footage in the opening title sequence. That was a big deal in 1989. You kids today just don't know how good you have it with media on demand. Muppet Babies was produced under CEO of Marvel Productions, Margaret Loesch. Margaret had previously worked for Hanna-Barbera back in the late 70s as Vice President of Children's Programming and then later as Executive Vice President. Then, in 1986, she murdered Optimus Prime. Alright, that's not entirely true. It was armed combat during a time of war which isn't classified as murder and she wasn't actually actively involved in the battle that cost Prime his life. She was one of two executive producers listed on the 1986 Transformers movie, and it's highly unlikely that she was the sole person responsible for ordering the kill shot. But there's probably a paper trail out there that leads from Galvatron to Unicron to Megatron for any enterprising journalists who are looking to make a name for themselves. Just be careful. Don't get too close. After all, she did kill Optimus Prime. <laughs> In 1990, Margaret left Marvel for Fox to head up the Fox's new Fox Children's Network, aka Fox Kids. Having worked on the Pride of the X-Men pilot and other Marvel animated productions, she was already sold on the potential brand power of the X-Men and knew that Fox could be the place to finally get it done. At Fox Kids, she ordered 13 episodes of The X-Men, a decision made even easier by the performance of Warner Brothers' Batman at the box office and on television on Fox. Batman released in 1989, and Batman Returns in 1992 set Batman the Animated Series up for the incredibly strong ratings and more mature look and tone. It's the same base audience that X-Men would be hoping to appeal to a year later in 1993. 
And you know, not for nothing, but between the release of Batman in 1989 and Batman Returns in 1992, Marvel's new X-Men comic with art by superstar Jim Lee would set the record for most copies of a single issue sold at four billion copies. Million? Million? I mean, that's still pretty good. Saban Entertainment was hired to produce the show. They then hired a studio called Graz. Raz Entertainment to assist since they didn't actually have the capacity to physically produce a show at the time. So bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. They contracted Graz Entertainment, who actually did all the development work on the show. Script writing, character design, environments, storyboarding, everything except the actual painting of the cells, which was done by a South Korean studio called ACOM, and the voice casting and production, which was handled by Canadian Studios. Canada, where Wolverine is from. Ron Wasserman produced the unforgettable, no matter how hard you try, theme song, and then it was go time. No, wait, it was production delay time. Look, this is Marvel in the early 90s, not Warner Brothers in the early 90s. Batman had all the money he needed to get his animated series rolling, and for some reason, if the Bat crew needed a little more money, Warner Brothers was there to pick up the check. For Marvel, if you couldn't do it with the original budget, then you had to sort of just figure it out. There was no more money. Fox had originally targeted September of 1992 as their premiere date, but September turned to October. The first batch of animation that was received from Acom Studios was fraught with errors, and it was going to take some time to fix it before they could show it to the public and put the Fox and Marvel names on it. The errors almost cost Acom their contract for the show. That's a pretty low bar, though. I mean, you literally had one job. <laughs> X-Men had their choppy taped together debut on Fox Kids Saturday, October 31st, 1992, but the rest of the series wouldn't be seen until 1993 until after the production team could get it right. They all knew it could be a success, they all believed in it, none of them wanted to sacrifice quality so early in the life of the series. In its first season, X-Men recorded top ratings. Batman was Fox's daily hit and X-Men brought it home on the weekends. With a primary roster featuring Cyclops, Wolverine, Rogue, Storm, Beast, Gambit, Jubilee, Jean Grey, and Professor X, they were the new stars of Marvel. They were the ones who were paving the way for the rest of the Marvel Universe as media entities. Spider-Man, Iron Man, and the Hulk would all reach TV within the next three years on the strength of X-Men's first season. On top of that, after the highly successful first season, Margaret Loesch and Saban had a much better working relationship. Saban was welcome to pitch whatever he was interested in at the time for consideration by Margaret and Fox. Just so happens that he had been trying to get some American television producer to take a look at his ideas for importing and rebranding of Japanese live-action superhero shows. Margaret would be the one to take him up on his offer, kicking off 1993 with the X-Men and closing it out with another 90s staple, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. X-Men ran five seasons through 1997 and was never technically cancelled. It reached the conclusion of its 65 episodes, it fulfilled its four-season order obligation, and then another season was ordered. Costs were cut, the production wasn't the same, and then it made its exit, but it exited on its own terms with an actual finale. X-Men would find a brief second life in reruns after the box office success of the live-action X-Men film in 2000, but would give way to the next generation of X-Men animation when X-Men Evolution debuted in November of 2000. In 2015, the timeline and a physical part of the universe was featured in a limited series during the Secret Wars crossover event in Marvel comic books. For the event, different alternate reality versions of the Marvel Universe were all smooshed together to create Battle World. One of the regions in Battle World was the X-Men 1992 era Earth. It ran for an initial six issues, but was popular enough to get picked up for an additional volume lasting ten issues. Each era of Marvel's growth as a company and pop culture entity has been defined by characters that connected with the growing fanbase seemingly at just the right time. The X-Men were the right team of heroes, the right kind of drama, the right look and feel for the 90s. The animated series was the perfect launching pad for the next era of Marvel as it graduated to the big screen and box office glory around the world. Thank you for watching. Please give this video a like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber, share this video, check out our Patreon if you're in the position to help the channel grow at patreon.com slash toygalaxy, and let us know in the comments below if you're still hearing that theme song in your head all the time while you work, while you're trying to sleep, and which one is stuck there more often, X-Men, Power Rangers, or Super Mario Brothers? <laughs> <laughs>